Welcome to RWM Blue Water Ministry. I'm your host Bob Anand and the message today is titled The Ministry of Crazy. If you have asked God to forgive you your sins and made Jesus Lord of your life then you are saved and you have been made into a new creature, a new creation. Here's what God's Word says about you. In 1 Peter 2.9, and this is uh, the New International Version, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now that same verse, 1 Peter 2.9, uh, out of the King James Version, starts off saying, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. So where King James says a peculiar people, the NIV says God's special possession. And all that means is that you're not like other people. You're a peculiar people. You're God's special possession. So you are different from all other people. Heaven is yours. You are a believer. You are a chosen person. So let's look through the Bible uh, and see some people that God chose and used. So in Judges chapter 13, verse 2 and 5, the birth of Samson. A certain man of Zorah, named Manoah, from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine, or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. Now you know, <laughs> never cutting your hair, uh, he is going to have a peculiar appearance. And if you are acquainted with the story of Samson, you'll know that uh, he was more than a peculiar character. But he was used of God. Let's consider Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 2. Now King Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. So he's laying in bed. He's bedridden now because of this injury. So these messengers go on their way to consult uh, a foreign god. And on their way, the prophet stops them and gives them a word to take back to the king. So in verse 5 it says, When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, why have you come back? A man came to meet us, they replied, and he said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and tell him, This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. The king asked them, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They replied, He had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. The king said, That was Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah was a prophet of God and was used mightily by God. He spoke the truth to King Ahab, king Ahab and Jezebel. He had the contest with the priests of Baal and won. He mentored his replacement, Elisha the prophet, and many more works he did as directed by God. Consider John the Baptist, Matthew 3, uh, verses 1 to 5. 
In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Um, and I'll just point out there, you know, because we just saw that Elijah had a garment of, of hair with a leather belt. And uh, in the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi, it says, and, 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 the, and the Elijah shall prepare the way for the Lord. Be one calling in the wilderness. And then so here's John the Baptist dressed, dressed in, in uh, camel's hair and with a leather belt. And Jesus later on says that, uh, that John the Baptist would, would be like as in the ministry of Elijah. Anyway, verse 5. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So you can imagine there were people there who thought he was crazy. Like him, he's in camel hair, he's got a leather belt, he's eating locusts and honey, and he's in the middle of the Jordan River preaching, repent for the ill, and, and he's baptizing people. So a uh, little out of the ordinary. So, I mean, surely there were some people who thought he was crazy. Uh, Jesus. In, in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 18 and 19, this is Jesus speaking. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I'm going to read that again. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. It's not people's opinion of you that defines you. It is what you do. In the book of James chapter 2, the writer says, I will show you my faith by what I do. Faith without actions is dead. So let's consider the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 11, 23b-27. This is Paul speaking. He says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone uh, without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I faced daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And he's referring to the churches that he planted while he was on his missionary travels, uh, like the church in Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Corinth, uh, etc. So you see that Paul was a, a dedicated and devoted apostle, and he went through an awful lot. Uh, so in Acts, we see the Apostle Paul in chains, defending himself before King Agrippa and Governor Festus. So this is Acts 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So Paul gave his testimony about how he too persecuted the church until Jesus appeared to him in a vision and called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So 
he explained all that had happened through him and his travels and everything. And uh, so verse 22, but God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. So you see, many people think that those who speak of faith and salvation are crazy. Anyway, verse 25, Paul responded, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar, is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was done. It was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. So Paul just was, was very clear. He said, you know, like, I'm a man of God, I'm a man of faith. And he says, and I wish for all of you who hear this, you would be like me, except standing here in these chains. You know, that you'd still be walking freedom, but I, I wish you had what I had, the salvation of God. So in the last 2,000 years, there have been many examples of people who have been quickened in their faith and have been considered to be crazy, or at least peculiar. Consider Martin Luther founder of the Lutheran Church. Luther was ordained to the priesthood in the Catholic Church in 1507. He, became, he came to reject several teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, he disputed the view on indulgences. In 1517, Luther penned a document attacking the Catholic Church, Church's corrupt practice of selling indulgences to absolve sin. And what that means is if you view a loved one who died, then for a price, you could pay the church and they would pray for them to get them out of uh, purgatory and, uh, and to move on and to, into a, a better life and, and have heaven. Uh, so that's what they were doing. And, and, and he, as he read the Bible and studied, he just thought that was a, a corrupt practice. So on October 31st, 1517, uh, Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of St. Peter's Basilica the document highlighted two central beliefs, that the Bible is the central religious authority. In other words, what he was saying is, what the Bible said supersedes anything that even the church says. And also, that humans may reach salvation only by their faith and not by their deeds. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is through faith. That's how you're saved. And that, was the spark for the Protestant Reformation. On November 9th in uh, 1518, the Pope condemned Luther's writings as conflicting with the teachers' teachings of the church. He gave Luther 120 days to recant his writings in Rome. Luther refused to recant, and on January 3rd, 1521, Pope Leo excommunicated Martin Luther from the Catholic Church. Now, Luther hid in the town of Eisenach for the next year, where he began work on one of his major life projects, the translation of the New Testament into German, which took him 10 years to complete. Finally, the Word of God was available to the people in their language. Luther had previously written against the church's adherence to clerical celibacy, and in 1525, he married Catherine of Bora, a former nun, and they had five children. So just as a side note, it may be worth noting that there are 24 rites or branches of the Catholic Church, the main one being Roman Catholic, and the other 23 making up the uh, different areas of the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church. In the beginning, 
all Catholic priests were allowed to marry and have children. And it was around the year 1100 AD that the Roman branch of the Catholic Church prohibited priests to marry. Anyway, so consider John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement. John Wesley was an English cleric, theologian, and evangelist who was leader of, of a revival movement within the Church of England known as Methodism. Now, in England, it's, it, it's known as the Church of England. Uh, that church in Canada is the Anglican Church, and in the United States it's the Episcopal Church. But it all gets its roots from the Church of England. Um, so at its heart, the theology of John Wesley, Wesley stressed the life of Christian holiness, to love God with all one's heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love one's neighbor as yourself. And of course, that's actually what Jesus taught, the, the two greatest commandments. Love God with one's whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Wesley's teaching also stressed experiential religion and moral responsibility. And uh, uh, well, all that means is, is that it's, it's, it's not, it's not, Christianity is not a sleepwalk. He said, you experience it. Like, you experience your faith. You ex it's, it's like being quickened. It's, it's like you're made alive. It, it, there's an experience to be had. And then with that comes your moral responsibility. You're accountable for your actions. The Church of England found him to be too controversial and too enthusiastic. In his early ministry, Wesley was barred from preaching in many parish churches, and the Methodists were perse persecuted. A key step in the development of Wesley's ministry was like Whitefield, who was another minister, to travel and preach outdoors. So when, when, when John Wesley came to a town, uh, he couldn't preach in the church, so he would go outside of town in the fields and start preaching out there, and the crowds would flock around him, and he'd preach, and people accepted the Lord and got saved, and, and revival was happening in England. As he was a, became an outdoor preacher. And not that he chose to be an outdoor preacher, but it was more of a necessity because people were closing the doors to the church to him. They wouldn't let him come in and preach. So moving across Great Britain and Ireland, he helped form and organize small Christian groups that developed intensive and personal accountability, discipleship, and religious instruction. He appointed itinerant, unordained evangelists to care for these groups of people. Under Wesley's direction, Methodists became leaders in many social issues of the day, including prison reform and the abolition of slavery. He later became widely respected and by the end of his life had been described as the best loved man in England. Throughout his life, Wesley remained within the established Church of England, insisting that the Methodist movement lay well within its tradition. Then there was Amy Semple McPherson, founder of the Four Square Church. McPherson was the most famous evangelist or revivalist in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, said Matthew Sutton, author of Amy Semple McPherson and the Resurrection of Christian America. Every American living in that period knew who she was. She began traveling the country and leading revivals before women even had the right to vote. Her Angelus Temple in Los Angeles was an early megachurch. She was one of the first women to receive a broadcast license hobnobbed with celebrities and appeared briefly on Broadway in the 1930s. The church she founded in the 1920s grew into the Four Square Church, which now claims almost 8 million members worldwide. Then there was Catherine Coleman. Kath uh, Coleman, Coleman traveled extensively around the United States and in many other countries, holding healing crusades between the 40s and the 1970s. She was one of the most well-known healing ministers in the world. So now, personally speaking, I actually attended one of her healing crusades in London, Ontario in 1975. She was very flamboyant. She had a slow, drawn out, deliberate way of speaking, dressed in long gowns with flowing sleeves. And she was very animated. She died uh, early the following year in 1976. So there are many evangelists today that some people think are crazy and that some people enjoy to criticize. I remember the first time I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, as a side note, there is a video on this website called Bob Monuk's Testimony. If you go to video 
and select testimonies, uh, you'll see it. And it describes my journey in finding faith in Jesus. But I was, I was radically saved. I was telling all my family and friends that Jesus saves. I was so excited, I just had to share it. I, I know I looked crazy, but I had, and I had friends tell me so. Uh, I had the wife of one of my close friends tell me, Bob, you scared us back in those days. Of course, now we attend the same church. As I trusted God throughout moments of my life, people surely thought me crazy. And today, I see the end of days at our doorstep, and I am saying so. And I know I sound crazy when I say it. I'm talking about all the Christians disappearing off the earth, what is called the rapture, and the great tribulation in Armageddon. All the things that the Bible prophesies will happen. Uh, and on that note, um, I have on my website a four-part series called Jesus is Coming Soon. On this website, select videos and end times. If you want the details on further details on those subjects, the Bible talks about watchmen on the wall, who understand the times and sound the alarm. In Ezekiel 3:17, God is speaking and says, "Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak." And give them warning from me. In other words, sound the warning. In Isaiah 52 verse 8. The watchmen shout and sing with joy. For before their very eyes they see the Lord returning to Jerusalem. And folks, that's what's going to happen. The Lord Jesus one day is going to return to Jerusalem. And, uh, and I don't think that's very far off. But here's the point. Like a watchman, I am prepared to appear crazy to speak truth. So that is the ministry of crazy, to humble oneself and speak the truth. It's being abandoned and just sharing what you've experienced with other people so that they will get the message. God says that it's his will that none should perish, but all would come into the knowledge of his salvation. And, and that's what compels us, is to share that, so that people will call out the name of the Lord and be saved. And the more we talk about it, yeah, we may sound crazy, uh, but we have no choice. <laughs> we have no choice. It, it comes out of us. We need to share it. We have to share it. Uh, because we don't want anybody to be lost. The, the, the way God says, hey, it's his will, none should perish. We don't want to see anybody lost. We want them all to come into the knowledge of Christ. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you draw us into all truth. I pray for each one who has heard this message. Almighty God, I pray you would touch their lives, manifest yourself around about them, that they might sense your presence, that they might sense that they're not alone, but that you are with them. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh Lord, I pray for each one who's hearing this message that they might be saved. I pray, Lord, you would draw them unto yourself, and that they would declare the prayer, and, uh, and that they would come into you, that they would call it in your name, and they'd be saved. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to pray the prayer of salvation, again, there's a video on this website. It's, it's under uh, videos, and then from the host, and it's called uh, the prayer of salvation, the sinner's prayer. And, uh, and it'll be a, there's a prayer in there that will just lead you in a prayer uh, to ask for forgiveness. All you have to do is follow, follow, follow the prayer. Just repeat it after uh, to be saved. Ask for salvation and um, declaring Jesus Lord of your life. And if you say that prayer, if you are saved, then you need to get a modern day language Bible and join a faith-filled church. 
um, and uh, surround yourself with faith-filled people so that you can start being disciple, discipled in the things of Christ, learning what it is to walk in the truth of God's Word and uh, being all that God's calling you to be. God bless you. This is Bob Minook from RWM Blue Water Ministry declaring blessings on you and yours until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.